Good, today we're gonna to talk all about how to identify common neck and shoulder conditions to help you sleep uninterrupted, stop reaching for pills, and return to being active. Most likely you're here because you or someone you know has neck or shoulder pain that's causing difficulty sleeping, reliance, or a fear of reliance on pain pills, interruptions to lifestyle, whether that's being active, uh, caring for family members, grandchildren, uh, others. I had a, a patient who really wanted to be able to bake and getting down to reach into the oven it was getting harder and harder uh, because of the shoulder issue. So these things that interrupt our lifestyle are, are, are reasons why we're looking to get something done or improve that. And often they're wondering if anything can be done about it that don't include pills or rest that they've been prescribed by their doctors, the suggestion of injections or eventual surgery. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about those as well. Our hope here with hosting this webinar is that we're able to help you understand some of the common causes of neck and shoulder pain and uh, help you know what other treatment options exist that don't include pills, rest, injections, or surgery, uh, but more of a restorative maintenance and preventive care program. Um, and this is who we are. We're prevent preferred physical therapy where we help people aged 40 plus in Northwest Phoenix stay active and independent, live free from painkillers and avoid surgery. Even if they've had pain for years, I've, I've been amazed at how many people will come to me and say, well, I'm, I'm in my 30s. I see that you treat people over 40. Am I a good candidate for what you, what you do? And the answer is, is yes, as long as you are someone who wants to stay active, live free from painkillers and avoid surgery, we can help. Uh, we, we've helped people as young as seven and eight with some issues that they were having with leg pains and whatnot. So um, it's not exclusive to those people above 40, but it is a, a population of people who we, we enjoy treating. We, we love having patients uh, who are in this mindset because mostly they're, they're mature, they're committed, they, they, it's very clear what they're wanting to do and understand that, that uh, good help is hard to find and are willing to accept our offers to, to help them. So we, we love having uh, people in our office. And just by way of introduction to the neck, the neck anatomy, and why some things get more complex or, or problematic, why sometimes things linger. Uh, this picture here on the left, where the, it's the back of the head, and as we peel away a few layers, there's a very unique set of muscles called the suboccipital muscles, and each of these have names. I won't go into too many details with all these names, but what you'll notice the upper neck and particularly right behind the head and neck area, what it's not showing either are some of the nerves that will come out from here that make it uh, the head and neck very unique in obviously in how we operate, how we function, but also our ability to stay level. You know, our eyes are also unique. We have a vestibular system that participates in keeping our head level or our eyes fixed on a target while our head is moving. These set of muscles are, are involved in the very fine movements of our head and neck, um, but also a source of great tension, especially as we go into uh, postures and positions, which we will a little bit later on. Another area of, of intrigue is this, these muscles here on the front part of the neck. This big, big one, the sternocleidomastoid, because it goes from the mastoid process in the back of the head here, all the way down to the clavicle or collarbone and the sternum, which all lie here in the front. It's a big source of myofascial pain and tenderness. We'll go over that. You have your trapezius muscle, which uh, we'll go into with this next slide that we'll show a little bit more, but this is part of it as well. And then we have this little tunnel here, this um, triangle we call here that a lot of nerves will exit. And these nerves go down the arm and they innervate this picture at the top here. You'll see these are the bones of the spine, the cervical spine, and the nerves as they exit and they come down into the arm and hands. Much like the lower leg, or rather the lower lumbar spine, has nerves that come out of it and innervate down the leg. And what's unique uh, about those sections of the spine, you, you know, different from the thoracic spine, is that they do have nerves that go to the limbs. And because they do, it's actually very formulaic or very reproducible in terms of what areas of the body relate to what nerves of the spine. 
and they've been able to map these out. These are called dermatomes. These are areas of, of skin or sensation that are innervated by which levels of the spine. And so you can see how they, how they map out accordingly. The neck, similarly, a set of muscles uh, and joints that make it up, but where it becomes uh, unique, or rather how the two are intercorrelated is because of this trapezius muscle. This trapezius muscle, um, very wide and very broad fanning distribution that goes out to the tip of the shoulder, comes down to the middle of the back and up all the way to the back of the head. Uh, it's a big player in neck and headache pain, as well as shoulder function. And as we peel that layer away, we get to this image here on the right side of this body. We're looking at the back side of it. And we see just how many muscles are correlated to the shoulder blade to the shoulder. Another one that plays a big part of this levator scap. And it goes from this we'll call the superior angle of the scapula or shoulder blade and then goes up into the upper cervical spine. This is another big one that plays a part in headache uh, or neck, neck and headache problems that are often correlated with shoulder dysfunction. And so we'll, we'll go to a little bit of that. What's really unique about the shoulder is, is how we have the whole arm bone, the shoulder blade, all that structurally is connected only by this little pencil thick bone called the clavicle or collarbone. That's the only structural attachment or bony attachment the shoulder has to the body. And so the shoulder is very dynamic. It's very dependent on muscle and ba uh, muscle balance and muscle health. And so we'll talk about some of the dangers of having muscle imbalances or myofascial pain patterns, what trigger points or knots mean, and why that plays a part in shoulder and neck impairments. Because whenever we have those kinds of issues that are restricting mobility, restricting strength, you can tell how because there's very little structural stability to the shoulder, it can be a, a, a big disruptor when it's not in, in place or not balanced right. Uh, one other thing to note is this is the arm bone here. This is the, the arm that goes down. This, we call this the head of the humerus. And uh, the relationship I want you to see here is that this, this attachment, this glenoid attachment, where the head of the humerus sits on top of it, we call it like a golf ball and a golf tee relationship. Where the golf ball, being the head of the humerus, is much larger than the golf tee or the glenoid fossa. And so because of that, there's a lot of soft tissue support that is needed around this glenoid. There's a, a deepening or fattening tissue of called the, the labrum that broadens this surface out. So there's more congruence, what they call it, uh, more connection of the joint surface of the arm bone to the shoulder without it being so loose or lax. But it is also a source of weakness where if we do have tears or fraying of that labrum, which is quite common as we age, uh, we get some 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 instability in that shoulder. So one thing I want you to be aware of, the other one is this space underneath here. There's muscles and bursa sacs here and, and nerves that all come underneath here that innervate or part of the rotator cuff, excuse me, and innervate the rest of this shoulder musculature that plays a big part in this space. On this picture actually much, looks much larger than it really is. This acromial hood here comes much closer. It sits really on top of that head of the humerus Oops. and it com um, compresses the space here. So we'll go over a little bit of, of why that's important to be aware of. Um, and then I, I wanted to go over some myofascial patterns and why these play a part in neck and shoulder dysfunction. Much like we have those nerve patterns that go down the arm, we also have patterns that correlate to myofascial pain in the upper neck and shoulder area. And very common, I get people who complain of like a pinching or burning in the middle of their shoulder blades. Uh, Maybe a pinching and burning over into the side of the shoulder blade or on top. And these are highly correlated to neck dysfunctions. And so it's important when we talk to these people that we explain why are we doing neck exercises or why are we doing these things for the neck when it's my shoulder that's a problem. The pain's here between my shoulder blades. Why are we treating up here? And often because, well, the source of the problem is up here. You may not be feeling it there, but and you're feeling it down here, that's because there's a referred pattern that is actually leaking that symptom down into those areas when really the problem exists up here. Uh, I had a good friend of mine, a very dear friend of mine, he's like, I feel like there's an ice pick or a stabbing sensation in the middle of my back. I go to the chiropractor, have everything cracked and popped, and nothing really seems to get better. It 
maybe feels better for 24 hours or so, but it, it always comes right back. And we had to go into a deep dive into uh, sitting postures and positions, some decompression work uh, for him to do on his own throughout the day to, to stay on top of his patterns and positions to free up his upper neck and middle neck so that this goes away in his middle of his spine. It was a big deal because he was having symptoms down his arm, the stabbing, burning pain in the middle of his back. And we had uh, to take a, a deeper dive into what was going on. If we, if we don't treat, if we only focus on, on the painful areas and treat you know, this musculature here that is commonly tight, commonly irritated, we're not gonna get to the root cause of the situation and not adequately recover. Uh, the other thing that we see a lot in neck and headache problems, how some of these muscles will refer pain patterns. So people who have like a ram's horn presentation for neck and headache problems, uh, sometimes TMJ issues are masked by uh, an underlying myofascial pattern from the neck. And so upper trap trigger points are a big part of this myofascial pattern. And why is the fascia interesting? You know, people, we, we, we sometimes call knots or trigger points as something as pathological or problematic. And, and they can be sometimes, they, they do play a part, but it's important to remember what they are. And a knot or a trigger point is a collection of muscle tissue, a taut band of muscle tissue that is typically associated with where the nerve from the spine comes down to innervate that muscle, meaning to send the signal to the muscle to, to act, to contract. And it's a choke point, much like a, an on-ramp to the freeway at, at rush hour, if it's congested and, and, and restricted in its ability to send a signal to the rest of the muscle, it slows it down. And in our case, physiologically speaking, we're looking at the fact that there is an overabundance of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine that is now congesting that ability for the muscle to relax. So there's this, this state of, of increased tension, or we call it tetany, which is a contraction or, or, or hardened state of that muscle that also becomes painful and tender, where it is contracted and shortened, it's, it's hard and stiff, and it's restricting our motion. And it's because this acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter, it stays, it remains in this state of activity without it being able to, to release or, or let go. And that's typically because of uh, a postural imbalance, a, a low long-term stretch or pull over that area or repeated postures or positions. And so we look at, at how to free that up and there's a few treatments that we'll go over with that. But um, that will happen. We'll get those knots, they'll be irritated, they'll be hot and tender. They'll be tender over those spots, but then they'll also refer this pain up into other areas. Not knowing that it's coming from a different source, so it's one thing that we pay attention to. And I'm going to show you this video here. What I really like about, of course, we're going to play a commercial during this this video. But um, I talk about myofascial pain, tenderness, and why it becomes a problem, and why this why this passive tension becomes such a problem. And I talk about this watermelon analogy. And if you haven't seen it yet, these people are putting rubber bands on this watermelon. And our muscles are much like these rubber bands. Uh, and over time, little by little, this passive tension in these muscles, particularly around those trigger points and knots, will lead to an injury. And as you'll see here, after so many rubber bands and so much time under tension, this watermelon is going to explode. And so what happens is so many people will think, well, how can this muscle tension be the problem? How can this muscle tension affect my joints, affect discs, affect nerves? And it's because this little bit long-term over time that then breaks it down. So arthritic type pain, arthritic type degradation, um, these little bits where because we get stuck in these postures, these positions, or these repeated activities, um, think of a factory worker, we think about doing these positions and these things over time uh, consistently without having awareness of other areas or other positions or postures that we need to get out of, uh, we get breakdown. And so that, that's just a, a graphic example that I like to use to demonstrate why we have arthritic changes to joints um, that like one side versus another, 
why we get stiffness uh, through muscles when it seems like I stretch this all the time. I stretch and I stretch and I stretch and it doesn't seem like it gets any looser. Uh, why does that happen? And, and often it's because we're, we're misaligned in interpreting what that, what that tissue needs, what that muscle needs. And so we want to do a kind of a quick assessment, some cervical range of motions and some shoulder girdle motions. So we do a, a test to see, okay, how restricted are we? What do we have? So big and tall, we sit up and we bring our chin down to our chest. We should be able to bring our chin to our chest all the way. It should be able to touch. We should be able to go nose to ceiling. So if you want to do it with me, you can, but you want to look up as high as you can, sit big and tall, and then bring your nose to ceiling. And we should get our face parallel to the ceiling, or we call it 90 degrees. Lateral flexion, we should be able to bring ear to shoulder. We should be about 45 degrees or half of 90. If we could lay our ear on our shoulder, that's one thing, but we want to be just halfway. So be sure we're not bringing our ear up to our shoulder, but we stay big and tall, loose and relaxed, and we bring our ear to our shoulder, and then rotation. We should be able to bring our chin over shoulder, 90 degrees. And as we age, some of that is restricted, some of that goes away just normally and naturally, but we want to really pay attention to how bad is that degradation and how different is it one side to the other. And then shoulder girdle movements. So flexion is a straight forward. Out in front, we should be able to bring our arm to our ear as we stay upright and tall. Abduction is to the side, extension is reached back behind us, and then internal external rotation, we go internal rotation. Actually, this is external rotation. We'll go from here, or we'll test reaching back behind our head. A internal rotation, we want to reach behind our back. This is when it really gets problematic for folks. If they can reach up their backside, you know, to either class a bra or reach behind a seat. I get a lot of moms who say, I reach back to get something for my kid behind and I and it's really painful or it's really um, or I can't do it and then we have shoulder blade movements protraction retraction forward and backwards and then elevation or depression is up and down these are big um, movements for the upper trap and why that's important we'll go over again as we've already mentioned that that plays a big part in head and neck so these are Two of my favorite exercises for, um, for the neck and shoulder and some that are very commonly done incorrectly. They might be prescribed commonly, but um, we see a lot of problems with uh, doing these correctly and, and chin tuck is, is basic. So Arla, I think for you, these are some good ones, um, actually perfect ones for you and we'll go over about why these are so important in your case. But the chin tuck is very simple. Um, because it's all about bringing the chin to the neck. And that was very easy to, to say, but as we start to do it, we find a lot of people will, will drop down and bring their chin down to the chest. But we want to bring it straight back. And you should feel a little bit of a stretch in those suboccipital muscles, those tiny little movers and stabilizers up in the back. And sometimes you'll feel it there, which is where we want to. Sometimes you'll feel it in the middle of your back. And if you're feeling it in the middle of your back, that means that the trapezius muscle is very tight. And that's our, our limiting factors. We can't quite get to those areas just yet because that upper trap um, and middle trap are very tight. So we like to say 10 seconds, 10 times, pulling that straight back. And then I like to couple that with scapular depressors. And that's, as you see here, there's, there's blue arrows and there's Yellow, or white arrows. The white aerial arrow direction is the one I want. It's more of a down and back. Straight down is just straight scapular depression. We want to work a little bit down and back. Not so much that we're doing like um, like the blue arrows where we're doing straight back, but more down and back. I like to say like you're tucking your shoulder blades into your back pockets, like you're sliding them down into your back pockets because doing so will actually help pull the upper trap and levator scap muscles into a little bit of a tension, and then we do the chin tuck. And if we do that with a chin tuck, we're able to get a, a bit more stretch and a little bit more lengthening through those muscles. So then as we come off of them, they're, they're less tense and less tight. But what also happens, as we contract and move those into position, we're putting ourselves in a more posturally stable positions, uh, which we find to be much more effective and helpful especially as we go throughout the day. Very easy to get caught in this forward rolled position. Our head and chin and chest 
what our chin comes away from our chest and we get into this extension that shortens these muscles, these suboccipitals in the back, which then puts them into spasm if they're there for too long. Same with our levator scap, it puts that on a bit of a slack and then what that doesn't allow it to do its job, which is to upright and stabilize. Good, I feel like we missed a couple of, um, I'm not sure what happened to this slide. Let me show this to you here, I'll just leave it here. Um, but some of the risk factors associated with neck and shoulder pathology, um, as I mentioned, uh, posture is a big one. Uh, one thing that we wanna be aware of, it, you'll hear a sitting posture and these can be fine temporarily. And in fact, this first one, they've done studies on, on low back pressure they call axial load or downward loading pressure. In this kind of position, this, this is actually better for the low back than an upright position without support. This actually lowers low back load, but as you can see what it does to the upper, upper back and neck, it's a lot of force or passive flexion that then requires these muscles to really hang and pull on, which then causes problems. And similarly here, like I was mentioning before, the rolled shoulders and then the chin coming away from the, the chest uh, into an extended position that puts these muscles here on uh, on slack or shortening and they're having to hold in a shortened position for long times and that's that's stressful on them uh, versus the the more upright and what we like to recognize is the fact that his chin is down so it's not down towards his chest but it's also not lazy or or we call it protracted through the jaw or or head area where it's pointing forward but we're more uptight into almost a retracted or chin tucked position and there's this dotted line. I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but you can see how in line his ears, shoulders, and hips are. That's more the spot that we want to be. What you notice, he's not overextended through that lumbar spine either, which is important because that puts everything up above it in a different spot as well. Uh, other things to remember, wearing a purse on one side exclusively, uh, especially ladies, uh, heavy purses. Everything's in their water bottles now. Wallets full of receipts and cards and and whatnot, hopefully cash, maybe I'm not sure, but this is laden, it's burdened down, and we typically have it on one side uh, because we're one hand dominant, uh, whatever that is, um, but just be sure to be carrying it on either side or, or lighten it up as much as possible. Uh, everything doesn't need to be in there if, if possible. Phone position is another big one. Uh, we get caught bringing the phone down to our chest, and then we get into a, a falling head or, or forced exflection, even in standing or sitting, both uh, for long periods of time cause problems. Short periods of time we can get over, but long periods of time cause problems. That's that, that passive strain or passive continuous breakdown, much like laying those rubber bands on a watermelon. Sleeping positions, well, uh, or poor sleeping positions is another big one. Um, getting, getting too many pillows behind, if we're on our back, too many pillows behind our head where we're in that forced flexion, causes issues, same with not enough to where we're in too much extension. Um, if we don't have the, the bottom of our neck and head supported is another big one. If it's too heavy, if too much of the, of the padding is up towards the top of our head, again, then forcing us into, into upper cervical flexion, that's a big problem. Uh, so just being aware of that, so if you're side sleepers, making sure that we do have clearance for our shoulder, but the end still adequate support so we don't get into sustained side flexion or side bend postures. Now, we all move around. No one stays in one posture throughout the entire night. Uh, so just a matter of setting yourself up for success early on as you go to sleep so that you give yourself the best chance for getting a restful night. What we go through is a, a, the four phases of care. We initially look at how to minimize pain and inflammation, kind of get over that initial phase of, of being very uncomfortable and not sleeping very well and, and getting those, those pain patterns under control. And a lot of it's identifying when does it hurt the most and under what activities. How can we curb that initial cycle of reproducing that inflammatory phase and getting you, uh, getting you out of that, being able to disrupt that as quickly as possible. And then we move on to being able to restore mobility, flexibility, strength, uh, and stability. Because being able to do so gets you in those postures and positions that you can maintain for long periods of time. The longer you're able to maintain those with less pain, the better, because that's, that's gonna slow down that, that slow decay or slow breakdown of those joints and tissues as if we're putting more, the rate at which we're putting the rubber bands on that watermelon to cause injuries slows down, if not stops completely because of our ability to, to be in 
um, in more stable, upright postural positions. And so we look at, re at doing that. Now, what's, what's often confusing about stage two in, in increasing in strength, a lot of studies show, um, you know, we can't get any hypertrophy or muscle growth within, within six weeks. After six weeks, we can start getting some measurable changes to that, um, but, we, but we can't do it before then. So how do we increase the strength? Well, the then interesting thing about muscles and how they work is that there's a neurological component, an efficiency component to muscle contraction. And so even muscles of the same size can become more efficient, more productive in producing force because of the way in which they are innervated or fired. Meaning that as we, you'll notice a lot of people, but as we learn to develop skills, movement, I'm talking about movement habits, or we call them motor programs. Our ability to produce that becomes faster, but also more productive, meaning that we have more fibers contracting at the same time and in the same, um, in the same sink to produce the movement. And so a lot of people will say, I'm doing, the same, I'm doing the same exercises every time. Well, it's either two things. Number one is because you're not doing it right by yourself, or number two, it's because we're trying to get that motor program dialed in. We're trying to get you to be very effective and productive in getting those muscles to fire in the right sequence, in the right order, in order to produce those, those movements that we're intending to. A lot of things we'll do from a foundation level um, for that purpose. And people think, oh, I'm still doing this exercise as if they're not progressing. And I can understand that concern. And it's one thing that we need to do a better job of communicating. But one thing that, uh, you know, for this purpose, I want you to know that a lot of times that's in place because we still want to reinforce those movement habits so that they become very easy, very quick to replicate on your own. Uh, and then stage three is the, is the ability to then transition those things, the, the new mobility, the new stability, the new strength that we have into your function and activity. How do we do, how do we then apply those things to your goal to, you know, whether that's cycling, whether that's reaching overhead, painting, you know, for our patient earlier, being able to, to open the oven door and reach and pull heavy items out without injuring her shoulder, you know, how do we, how do we then apply those movements and that new strength to those activities is where we go to stage three. And then stage four is, is uh, maintenance and prevention. I've, I'm asked several times, you know, how patients done their discharge, they're thrilled with what they're able to do without pain. And they say, now, when do I stop doing my exercises? And it's like, well, Never is the answer. The caveat to that is we just slow it down. Don't, don't think that you have to do them every day as rigorous as you have been, uh, but be intentional about doing them throughout the week, throughout the month, so that there's some practice in place in doing those exercises and doing those things to help strengthen and prevent reoccurrence of injury. Uh, what happens all the time, uh, our, our bodies, we're, we're on, we're on we have an expiration date, right? We, we don't know when that is. We don't know how it's going to work, but our bodies are breaking down and we, we lose strength. We lose vision, our sense of taste and smell, hearing, all these things. All these things are on a slow decay. Now, we don't have a, a pill or an exercise to prevent aging, but what we do is if we're on this, this trajectory downhill because of, because of age and normal wear and tear, well, we can't change that, that downhill we can change the trajectory. So now we can, we can reduce the rate of that decline. We can, we can manage the rate of that decline. We can also manage uh, arthritic flare-ups and um, any kind of inflammatory process associated with some of the, the things that we have going on, whether that's cartilage breakdown, arthritic breakdown, or joint breakdown, whether we have some you know, fraying or tears in the shoulder, we can significantly mitigate and change the rate at which those things break down, the severity of the injury sustained or suffered from those things uh, because of a specific or strategic maintenance and prevention program. And that's one thing we hope to be able to offer um, towards the end of physical therapy. And then that brings us back to where we, uh, we picked up. I'm not sure how we got messed up there. I feel like I clicked one button and then suddenly we skipped ahead. I was surprised to see this slide when I did, but um, but in conclusion, we do have uh, just some things to, to work on uh, with those exercises, but because the cervical spine has nerves that go to the shoulder and to the neck, 
and the upper arm that all works together to produce that functional range and why so often we see combinations of neck and shoulder pain um, and uh, how many things can go wrong in the neck, whether it's through car accidents, previous injuries, uh, previous activities that were going on for, for a long time that then can change the way that we, we age or experience age-related changes. Um, and hopefully we've been able to give you a, a bit of a peace of mind and understanding of, of what all goes on and why surgery and MRIs are not the, the only thing to diagnose what's going on. Knowing uh, what, what joints or tissues are responsible, why we have limitations, and then be able to uh, formulate a plan, uh, a, a, a dose of care that's specific to your limitations is hugely important in identifying um, Number one, if you can succeed with conservative care and avoid injections or surgery, or if, hey, you know, we tried it, it was it, it, everything that we needed to do, but something more aggressive needs to happen, then you can move on comfortably knowing that this is a, the next best choice for you. Instead of always wondering in the back of your mind, did I really need the surgery? Did I really need to go through however many hours of, of, of anesthesia and, and changes to my anatomy that now I have to deal with the rest of my life, um, certainly versus uh, could I have done something different earlier and been able to prevent this is a, is a big thing that we try and, and educate people on the, on the possibility that does exist. And then we have free reports available on our website. Um, it's down here below, preferredptaz.com. We have uh, you know, seven natural ways to stop daily annoying neck and headache pain and seven natural ways to end shoulder pain without relying on pills or seeing the doctor. Uh, those, are, those are free, you can uh, get those on our website. Just download those. We'll get an email. Um, you enter your information. We'll email you the link, and uh, and they're yours. It's an ebook that we've written. Uh, and good. Any any questions? That that concludes. We got some resources down here too, if you are interested. But let's see if I can end my screen share. Oh, there.